The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and I'm sitting at the controls, Al Warren. And on the East Coast, we have Mr. Michael Hawley. Hello, Al. Well, you're back. You've been gone for a while. Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I'm back, ready to go. So <laughs> Had his COVID and had his shots and everything, so you're all set. Yeah, yeah. only a little bit of scar tissue in the lung, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, at least it was only in the lungs. You know, yeah, there's a report sure. about the penis, hey, coming up now. <laughs> See, oh, my that, gosh. Two different universities now. Twenty men have had damage from COVID inside their penis. So just look out. Jeez. I'm just giving you. And you're old, too, right? You're... <laughs> very, very. Yeah, just a month older than you. Just remember that, Al. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm still 58. <laughs> hey, oh, I'm 59, so it's... Old man. Okay, well, now we have a uh, special. We have a double header today. We have two guests uh, writing under the name of O.E. Tierman. And we're going to be talking about the new book, The Hands Were Given, Aces High, Joker's Wild, book one. So uh, I'll introduce to you uh, our two guests. It's Olivia. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How about you? I'm wonderful. And then we've got E.S., Hey, Alan. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. It's always good to talk to people that are writers, writers, you know. Um, how did you guys, um, before we get into the book and into all the, what, what, what you've been up to, how did you two um, meet and get into writing together? We actually met about a, a decade ago now, give or take. Uh, when Olivia set up an Irish language speaking club through Meetup. And I was the only person who showed up to the first meeting, so we started talking, uh, realized that we both liked uh, play-by-post roleplay. And at the time, I was running a site for that, so I invited her in to write some stories collaboratively together in that format, and it just kind of rolled from there. (laughs) Well, that's interesting, uh, but uh, that's an interesting, uh, but, but how did you, were you um, like a writer to begin with? Like, were you already kind of into writing and wanted to be a writer? I was. Um, I've been writing since I was 12, uh, and I started trying to pursue traditional publishing around the end of my high school years. Um, it didn't work, thank goodness, because I needed a lot more practice, but... <laughs> I, I've been writing for as long as I could remember, and I kind of roped Olivia into it. And it's funny because I grew up with a very strong storytelling tradition in my family, but storytelling was an oral tradition that was for the home and the community. And I had a nascent idea that writers lived in ivory towers on academic campuses and didn't leave, and people like me didn't write books. And it took getting to know ES and getting out and about in Denver to realize that, hey, normal people can do this. I mean, I wouldn't call us normal, but... Well, yeah, yeah usually. <laughs> as, as I, us, maybe? <laughs> well, as I get to know uh, people, and even as myself writing, um, the further I get into life, the less normal I think I am, so... But, but but there must have been a point, like even if you're a writer or a storyteller, and, and I find this a particular point in your life that you felt confident enough to publish something you've written. And, and what do you think that thing was that happened to each of you to make you feel confident enough to, to, to let the world read your stuff? Start with a yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> no, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I like me, me making uh, guests think. Um, well, well, I mean, because, I, you know, there, I there must, have, but, but there must, you know, because like, you know, we all have our backgrounds where we're either we're storytelling or we want to write, mm-hmm. but we don't and all that. But there must, there's usually a thing that we kind of go, no, I can do this. I, and, and actually, like you said, you were sending 
you were thinking of going to a traditional publisher and it wasn't working, there, but there must have been some sort of something in you that thought, well, I'm, I'm good enough even if you weren't quite ready. Uh, I mean, for this particular series, that thing was Olivia, quite honestly. Um, we had written a draft of the entire series, and I was content to just put it on the shelf and let it be a thing that we wrote for ourselves, and it was cathartic because we were dealing with a lot of things that were coming up around 2016, uh, and Olivia pestered me into publishing it, and I still freak out every time I think about our books on Amazon and the fact that people are reading our books, <laughs> but they're there, so I have to pretend to be confident. <laughs> so Olivia is your confidence? Yeah, pretty much. Well, in two, 2016 was a pretty boring year. Nothing much happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, compared to 2020. <laughs> yeah, 2020. <laughs> Boy. Well, that, that, you know, that, that kind of ties in a lot. You know, the world we've lived in for the last, let's say, five years or, or a little longer maybe, um, a lot's happened and a lot of drama going on. Mm-hmm. And, and when you look at it, so n- n- your book is kind of, it's, it's science fiction, it's uh, dystopian. It's kind of got a lot of stuff going on that, is relatable to this world. So what made you, you know, I don't know if I say write it, but what made you kind of go in the direction that you did? Like what, what is it you hope people get out of the book? Well, actually it has an interesting backstory to it. Um, we started writing this series in 2016 as things were getting dark, as partly catharsis and partly it was my streak of, Let's call it perverse optimism. We had heard a really nihilistic streak in all the community conversations in our town of Denver. And a lot of the conversations kept coming back to, we're screwed, we're screwed. And like I said, I have a perverse streak of resolve in me. And I said, okay, fine, let's pause it, we're screwed. And let's write our way out of the darkest version of America we can imagine back into something good to prove, yeah, it can happen. Even if we fell all the way down into the dark, we could get back out of it somehow, some way. And so we started writing this series where it's a very dark version of America, but we write into that world a community of people who support each other, take care of each other, tease each other, are each other's family. And it was our way to prove to ourselves, even if things go all the way down into the dark, we will find a way back out. Well, Olivia, uh, or yes, you need Olivia. She sounds, she's this optimist for everything. I love it. Yeah. We actually balanced each other out really well. Uh, we got super, super lucky in picking co-writers in that respect, because personality-wise, we have enough in common that we can get along and we can understand each other. If my anxiety is acting up, Olivia can uh, empathize with that and we can talk about that. But also we have enough difference where Olivia is super optimistic and running ahead and I'm a little bit more reserved and keeping her from completely jumping off cliffs that we can't uh, see the bottom of. (laughs) Right. So, unlike um, the real world, um, I guess you have the power to make things um, end in a in a positive light or a better light. Is that sort of what you want to do with this this book series? A little bit more than that. It's not just happily ever after. It's the future doesn't have to be dark. The future can get better than it is today. And in fact, it has to, if it's worth living. So what are we going to do about it? I would say instead of a happy ending, we aim for an ending that gives hope and gives more than hope resolve. Yeah. Okay. We can do this. Well, I like that. Yeah. So there we go. We're, we're, <laughs> um, we, I mean, we just had Peter, Tatchell on, you know, he's the, um, uh, there's a Netflix about him, P- Hating Peter Thatchell, and he um, 
said that, that you got to kind of close your eyes and dream of the world that you'd want it to be and then wake up and make it happen. Exactly. Very, very positive. I recommend seeing the Netflix show for sure. Um, so your characters in this book, so um, Aiden, um, who, who is Aiden? Uh, where does Aiden come from? Aiden came a lot from my personal experiences, struggling with gender identity and mental illness and feeling accepted and being able to find community. Um, like, like Olivia said earlier, we, we started writing this partially as catharsis, and I needed an outlet for all of that that was sitting in my brain, and that kind of all got channeled, not all, but mostly got channeled into Aiden, who took those issues, I don't want to say to an extreme, but further than my person, my, my individual self does, has. Wow, I'm speaking really well today. <laughs> um, You're doing fine. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, Aiden came a yeah, lot sure. from, from me and my struggles and my desire to see that representation on the page that I hadn't seen before. So this is really a, uh, besides being a, a, you know, a great fiction, this is a self-help book, too. <laughs> Looks like. uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was for us <laughs> writing it, but yeah. uh, one of the things we wanted was to provide that, that representation and that hope and to say, hey, friends in marginalized communities, you're not alone. And if we can band together... Here, here's a way that we could potentially do it, and here's some role models in a way don't necessarily follow their pranks, but follow how they learn to support each other and how they learn to communicate. And if we can do that, maybe we can improve our own communities and the society around us. Yes, if you have a commanding officer, definitely don't put shaving cream in his shoes. However, <laughs> it's good for writing purposes. Oh, come on. Yeah, have some fun. But, yeah, um, we we definitely um, wanted to give role models for a number of different issues. So there's Aiden. There, the cast of characters is an ensemble, so there are a number of different characters with different issues going on. And each of them, in their own way, heals and grows by being part of this community. Well, it, how did, I was just going to ask about uh, your ethnobotany. Uh, does that is that part of the book, or is that uh, any characters with that? It um, no one character specifically gets it, but it is definitely a, it went into the backstory. Um, for example, um, careful readers will notice that a lot of the food is based in amaranth because it's 112 on a good day in the summertime in our future world. Um, we can't survive in a lot of places anymore. So they've replaced wheat as the staple crop with amaranth. And a lot of my research has gone into, if the temperature keeps going up, what will Colorado look like? Well, it'll look like New Mexico. Um, so none of my ethnobotany has specifically gone in, but I'm trained in horticulture, and a lot of my extrapolations from my own research has gone into the detail building of the world which has been fun because there are a lot of plants that I have seen in the Southwest, in the deep South, uh, south that I would never want to deal with. And I make our characters uh, deal with them. Yeah, okay. I, I, I wonder, so uh, you said each character has their own um, it, it, well, issue or challenge that they're trying to overcome uh, in a positive way or deal with. Um, where do you draw your characters from? People you know? Um, is, it, is it more than just personal? It's a combination of things. Uh, there's some personal, there's some people we know, there's some inspiration from news stories from around the world, um, things we pick up on the internet, basically anything that we found particularly interesting and compelling for us that made sense within the, the scope of the story, we tried to explore at least a little bit. So another question is uh, the 
because of 2016 and all of the uh, stuff going on in the United States, the you you could almost get yourself into trouble on certain readers because mm-hmm. you are kind of taking a side or something. So, but so is that why you approach it slightly differently so that uh, can it would be attractive to all readers? Oh, we are unabashedly taking a side. <laughs> we don't even try not to take a side. Um, because we're taking the side of the communities that we're close to and the communities that I've grown up in. And a lot of those are communities that have been marginalized. And so this is a story about scrappy underdogs who've been told that they're worthless, refusing to accept that and saying, no, you will take care of my people and you will respect us and you will treat us like human beings. Mm-hmm. And until you do, we'll resist. Well, I see that, and which, which is great. Uh, but do you kind of, you don't bring, uh, do you bring up, is it part of a, a political kind of thing going on so people would catch on or you are going to hook some of those other sides to kind of see the reality? It would be that- really nice if we could. Um we try to create characters that can be empathized with, and we try to show that people can be, for better or worse, humans can adapt to anything, including whatever they were taught as kids, for better or worse. But they can also unlearn very bad things. Um, so one of our characters is, spoilers, from the uppermost echelon of society, and He was taught some very classist, ableist, terrible things when he was young. And he unlearned all of that in order to learn to treat his colleagues and his friends like equals. So we do try to show that it doesn't matter where you come from. You can be a decent person. But also, yeah, um, there's a certain amount of you can't put everything on the cover. So we went with an aesthetic that is eye-catching and exciting, and then hopefully people will pick up the book and be invested enough in the characters that they'll accept a different way of being human and being alive in the world than they're used to for the sake of, oh, wow, that blew up. Yeah, so it's it's so easy. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, but it's so easy to drink the Kool-Aid and you're all set. (laughs) (laughs) Um, as far as the the political goes, Mike, um, we don't have anything necessarily super overt, like we don't drop names, but we do have some, some things in there where if you're paying attention, (laughs) you will understand what we're referring to. (laughs) Great. That has to start happening more. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It sounds like, um, You've you've got a lot invested in the story uh, of yourselves and of of the world around you. Um, so when you when you complete it, book one here, and um, you look back, um, how do you think it's changed you, each one of you? A lot. Uh, I mean, through the process of writing this, not only did I have the chance to face kind of that inner turmoil of myself, but I also learned how to communicate better because uh, Olivia and I were, were tossing things back and forth. And like I mentioned earlier, we both have anxiety, so we would accidentally be triggering each other sometimes. And learning both about how to interact with other people and how to better interact and own my own truth has been a really intense process, for lack of a better term, that this, that writing this book has definitely helped push me through. And I think I've changed a lot in that I've been able to stand in my own ground a lot more. I come from a very strong Midwestern nice culture, um, and I used to just disappear into the wallpaper 
um, at every opportunity. If someone disagreed with me, I immediately apologized and backed down. That was my training. And I have learned, I suppose, courage through this process. Mm -hmm. And I've learned better communication for sure. And I suppose I simply have learned that I don't need to make space for other people all the time. I deserve some space too. Mm -hmm. So, so what are you hoping um, to do in the series? Like this is book one, it said. So how many, how many more books do you plan to do? Or do you have this all kind of laid out? Is this, is this, have you thought about it or are you just going to wing it, play it by ear? We actually have a draft of the entire series ready. Um, it's, most of it's still in rough draft. We're looking at about eight books total, um, plus a potential young adult trilogy set afterwards. Um, yeah. <laughs> right now, <laughs> we're, we're relaunching the series, so we have more than one book out, but we're really focusing on trying to get book one into the hands of folks who want to read it get that hook in for, for when we relaunch everything else. Um, but yeah, go, going into publishing it with an entire draft of the series, I think has been really helpful because it's something we don't have to freak out about <laughs> when we publish every book. Oh no, what are we doing for the next one? That leads to a question I have is, uh, for both of you with, uh, you ever look at Al, he's really good at, uh, social media, uh, trying to get a, uh, an audience. Mm -hmm. uh, have you been doing that as well? Uh, and I'm, I bet for ES that would be difficult for you. Um, but uh, have you been trying to do that, uh, making uh, kind of ba making yourself available on different types of social media? Uh, we we do have social media accounts. I do social media for my day job, so I leave most of it to Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> and I pull it off by, um, so I'm a landscaper by trade. I own a small landscaping business. Um, in the middle of winter, I go on Buffer, and all year I've been saving anything that makes us laugh or looks important or is interesting, and I sort through this huge folder of things I've saved and things that caught my eye, and I load up Buffer with a year's worth of general social media posts. And then we write up books that we've liked in our own genre, and we do a weekly, but don't quote me on that, blog of reviews of podcasts and books and anything we've bumped into that we liked. And that has been a really good way to keep us reading in the genre so that we make sure we know what's going on with our own genre, but also make a lot of great connections with a lot of really cool people Mm -hmm. But, yeah, we've definitely gotten one or two gentle comments along the lines of, you look so active, but you never answer anything. And we're like, yeah, because all of that is preloaded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I can relate to that, but, you know, because I, I don't interact like I should. A lot of people comment on that. Um, I, I, I think the problem is because it's got to a point where I get – um, sometimes I get 200 messages a day, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of it's not very nice. <laughs> and so I found myself following. That's just from me. That's just from me. <laughs> I, 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 you know, because in in the world today, uh, it seems to be there's a lot of people that really enjoy hating you for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And and so what they do is they follow you, and they continue to hate you, and they send you three messages, a, a, you know, a week. Mm -hmm. Three emails saying how much you're you're disgusting or whatever, and so they kind of do this. And um, when you get so many, after a while, I, it, it, the very first is to respond, and then of course, then you learn no, it's better not to. But then it's hard to start going through them all to find out which is good and which is bad. Mm -hmm. So you just start kind of. I, so I, I've almost kind of walked away from that end of it. Uh, because um, if you get too involved in that, then you lose focus on what you're trying to accomplish, like your writing or whatever it is that the person yeah. tries to do. So, right, and we've got books to write. Yeah, and, and, you, and not only that, the thing is what happens is um, I think it absorbs into how you write then. 
you know, if you're holding on to this anger, if you're having a fight with people that are online and all this stuff, uh, it really doesn't mean anything because it's not that important. It really isn't. But you get so wrapped up. Then when you go to write, it, it changes the way you write. So I, I think it's probably a good thing to stay away from. I mean, I get, I get it from all ends because I'm autistic, I'm gay, I'm colorblind, I've got it all. And mm. uh, people love to jump on all of it because I make mistakes, I'm human. I, I think the best thing you can do is own who you are, mm-hmm. so take it, and, and just run with it. Like I am who I am. I'm not any different offline as I am on or on air, off air. It's just this is who I am, and, and a lot of people dislike that. But at the same time, uh, I'm not going to change who I am. So I think that's an important point. And I also get the feeling that's kind of what you're trying to accomplish with this book and the book series. Yeah, Definitely. Although I'll admit a much more prosaic re- reason on my part. T- 12 hours in a garden when it's hit 100 degrees, Ooh. you don't have any brains left when you get home. <laughs> so I love my gardens. Um they take, they sap my energy in the summertime. So I pretty much don't turn the thing on. And I'm lucky if I get a chapter in the morning. Um, but yeah, it can get very toxic very quickly. And, um, I have some issues with, um, anxiety and social shame. So I'm very selective and very careful about how I interact with any of that. And I tell myself, yes, it's important to be on social media, but I have the right to draw the line and say, Mm -hmm. no, you don't get my energy. That's for my creative stuff. You don't get my energy. That's for my writing. Also, um, we are with a publicist and a press and amphibian press and creative edge publicity have been hugely helpful for us because they essentially sort the wheat from the chaff somewhat for us and say, (laughs) why don't you talk to so-and-so instead of us wandering around the dangerous terrain of social media saying, hi, can we be friends? Which is a good way to get bitten by something or someone. But yeah, um, like you were saying, Alan, the, the sense of community and the sense of being able to own yourself and to stand in your own power is is definitely something that we want to get, get through with this book. Um, in the writing of it, we both learned how a little bit more how to do that for ourselves coming from various marginalized communities. And not to sound too preachy, because it is still a fun sci-fi book, but it, there is kind of that hope for our readers to be able to find that power and that strength and that community within our characters. And kind of to that end, we have resources in the back of every book that um, deal with a lot of what we talk, what our characters go through in that book. So we've got mental health resources, trans resources, queer resources, um, things of that nature, because we do want this to be a fun book and a fun series, but we also want to be able to help people with it. Expect things to go the way they did, um, let's say around 15, 16, like did, 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 did it all sort of, it, it, you know, because I look at things and I'm I'm still shocked. I'm still surprised because it seemed to me like the 90s were a good time. And, I, I, you know what I mean? Not, not, not that things are great ever when you look back. You can always say it is. But I, I just... No, I totally get you. Cause like, it, people were not so angry, I think. In the 90s, it felt like we were on an upward slope. It felt like we were learning to accept each other and learning to be kind of that more of that melting pot. Uh, we obviously weren't there, but we were working on it, and then we kind of backslid. But no, we, we did not expect it at all, despite what happens in the books. <laughs> <laughs> we do have some running jokes about the fact that certain things were not intention, intended to be prophetic. <laughs> so it's your fault? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> I mean, if it is, then hopefully the good can happen, too. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you have to kind of... Um hope at the end of the day i mean it seems like every every bad thing that happens to us um eventually something good comes out of it it's it's it can sound terrible to say that but eventually it turns into something good or you know hopefully it does anyway right we 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 want the best for each generation that comes out and uh 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know. It's, it, you know, because I feel very distant to a lot of things happening now, too. And I'm only uh, 58, not 59. God, I would if I was that old, I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would break down. It's too much, right? Now, but, remember, Al, I have the body of a 57-year-old, so you watch oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, <laughs> well, I, I just I just don't know, um, you know, where it's all going to go. And I think that each year it goes by, it seems like I'm more distanced from the young generation. Do you like the way it's sort of turning out in, in the world now? Or do you, as in now that things are starting to change back again a little, do you, do you feel it's going in the right direction? Well, so... I will preface this by saying I'm a farm kid originally. And this is my gross farm kid metaphor. Um, when you're cleaning a septic wound, you have to get the pus out first. <laughs> and I think there are a lot of things that we had to see at their worst before we would face them head on and start to make amends and start to improve in tangible ways instead of just saying, oh, tell the kids we're a melting pot because obviously that didn't help. And I was one of those kids who was in school in the 90s. And I'm still standing here with my head spinning going, this is not what I was taught in school. But that said, I can see that now we've had to face it head on as a country. And we've had to really look this stuff in the eye. Essentially, we've had to look our own demons in the eye and realize that they're there. I think there is growth in that, and there is value. I want to say this very carefully because it should not have cost the number of lives that were lost for us to learn um, that we needed to do things differently. But I feel like we're starting to clean the pus out of the wounds of this country, and when pus comes out of a wound, it's disgusting. But after that, you start to heal. Also, the way I see it is it's kind of like the, the last stand for a certain segment of the population where now they're going to be more of a minority, so it's a big fear thing. And so it's like this was their opportunity. So to, I'm an optimist as well, so I see things going in the correct direction. So, so I think that your book is kind of a perfect timing for this. I'll be the resident pessimist. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to get into why because that will take longer than we have left but I, I do think that having the book and having the hope in the book and the hope in my co-writer definitely helps me face what I think is happening which is <laughs> nice So, and this is why we write scenes where um Aiden is being pessimistic, and his boyfriend turns to him and says, "Stop that." Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, but it, you know, it's easy to be that way because uh, you know we have hope, and then some things don't work out, and so we lose mm-hmm. faith, right? That's sort of um, uh, how it is. But uh, you know, as you were saying, you got to clean the the septic out, and uh, you know, uh, we see the pus every time it leaves Mar-a-Lago, so. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. Oh, nice. Yeah, that was Al. That was Al. He was a Canadian. Don't worry about it. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm Canadian. I'm allowed to say whatever I want. <laughs> nice. <laughs> about about the pus that lives down there, and, and I just sort of I I'm, I'm just sort of I'm still kind of in shock with the whole thing, but um, it's just what we got to deal with, and we're going to make it better. Mm-hmm. So um, so when you talk about um the book and you talk about the mental health resources and stuff. So do you think that's a, it's a, it's in a good place right now, mental health resources in the country or not? Oh God, no, no. So what do you think the problem is there? Like what do you think people are really scared to face the reality of, of the mental condition? And I can say this for a lot of things, not only with, sexual identity and and all all that other things but uh, you know there's another shooting today right there's all this stuff going on in the u.s that goes on nowhere else in the world Mm -hmm. to the extent so you have to attribute that to some sort of mental problem 
or, or too much pressure, or there's something going on to make people do this. This is another thing I could rant about for quite a while. So I'll try to boil it down pretty quick. Um, our mental health system is absolutely awful. There is yes. no support. It's incredibly difficult to get help. There is a very, very intense stigma associated with mental health and seeking mental health services, regardless of what you're seeking them for, which prevents a lot of people from even attempting to find accessible resources. Guns are more easily accessible than therapists and cheaper. And there is a lot of pressure to succeed financially and constantly be productive for your employer. Um, one of the things that we didn't intend to be prophetic, but kind of is in a way, is the corporations in our book literally owning people. And if you look at it from a certain point of view, we exist, and this isn't necessarily purely an American thing, but we exist to make money for the capitalist machine for our employers. They don't care about our mental health, about our physical health, about our social lives. As long as we can make money for them, that's all that matters. We're replaceable. And that is hardcore awful on the mental health to know that every day you go to work, you spend 40 hours a week with someone who thinks that you're replaceable and doesn't care. And we don't have a good vacation. We don't have family leave. We don't have a lot of things that a lot of the rest of the world has in any sense, like even a marginalized, a, a tiny little bit to help. And then if you add on top of that, all of the bigotry and the hatred that gets continually cycled through our media and through our leaders into our society, it just becomes a cluster. And it becomes this pressure cooker for people who have no other way to express themselves except through violence, except through lashing out because that's the only avenue left to them yes you should write a book with olivia maybe <laughs> oh, <laughs> i know right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, well and it's sad because it's a multi-layered problem um i come from a family that had many generations of walk it off you're fine was the mindset but we had a, a few suicides a generation well, my generation is finally saying and saying to the younger generations, we got to get help. We got to do something about this. And then we run into the fact that the entire system for mental health care and resources is vile. Um, and you can kind of understand why our forebears just said, walk it off, because it was the only option available. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's ridiculous too, right? You know, I I, I don't understand it, and and the healthcare is just crazy. Especially <laughs> no, no when problem. we're quote unquote the richest country in the world. Yeah, for the for the corporations, that's I think that's one of the things that stuck out most about your book was about corporations really kind of owning the country, and it's sort of something, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny because other countries, like even up in Canada, they're worried about um, that kind of mentality leaking over and it does um and and because there's still a lot of social activities like you know the medicine and all that that mm -hmm. you don't want to lose that because man once you see it like i i broke my ankle in seattle at work and what do i do i go home to vancouver to get my 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 surgery or anything done because it's 10 times better and it's free Right, exactly. <laughs> just... Well, and something that I want to underline for listeners is that we didn't make this stuff up. Um, we drew on what's happening now, but more than that, we drew on the American Gilded Age, which was roughly the 1860s to the 1890s. Um, a lot of the corporate control that we write about was already done by Rockefeller and Carnegie and Pullman. And the robber barons, as we call them in America, um, they had company towns where they decided that you lost your home and your and your livelihood if you didn't 
say, I think it was Carnegie, I may be wrong on that, said, if you don't go to church this many weeks in a row, we kick you out of town. Um, people deciding for you what your morality should be, your livelihood should be, your place in society and your worth and your expendability should be, that's already happened here in America. And one of the underlying themes of our book is, let's not have it happen again because we're headed there. And this is where I get less optimistic and more righteously furious is I know enough history that I can see us slipping into a second gilded age. And like you just said, Al, our health care for a country with the wealth and the resources that we have is vile. It is pathetic. Yeah. Yeah. It's an abomination. Well, yeah. it's, it's really bad, you know, like I have a family doctor in Canada I can go see any time. It's just totally different, a different feel and a different type. And, and mm-hmm. there's no system perfect. So people that say, oh, well, they did this or they do this wrong. It's like, no, there's no system that's perfect. But I'll tell you, um, I have access to both and I have uh, the medical in both. And I'll tell you, I, I don't even give it a second thought um, after being alive only 58 years, not 59, I re- realized that uh, uh, there's nothing I would choose to have done um, south of the border. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you know, what's interesting, Al, is that uh, about 20 years ago, I think, uh, that there was misinformation passed on to our electorate in, in the United <laughs> States saying that, oh, go to Canada and you're going to be in lines forever. Yeah. You know, the, <laughs> we, that's what everybody down here thinks. And then uh, so, but it was it was actually a scam, and it worked. Mm-hmm. So I remember hearing that trite. I hear but all my, sorts of stuff, and none of it. My partner true. lives in British Columbia. Yeah. They recently started therapy. It took them about a week to find, or not therapy. Sorry, they started medication. They it took them about a week to get a prescription. It took me two years to find a therapist Jeez. Wow. to start trying to find a prescription. And my own perspective on this, aside from my my family issues and the stories I've heard from some of my cousins, is that my grandma, I'll tell you this because the statute has run out and she's old enough that she won't get in trouble, but <laughs> she used to be um, the town, we called her the town help woman. If you couldn't afford the doctor, you would go to my grandma. She was a registered nurse, but on the side, she would help people who couldn't afford the hospital in this little town in Wisconsin. And that tells you a lot when little towns have these people who will help out on the sly and can get arrested because they're they're practicing medicine without a license. I do not recommend people practicing medicine without a license by any means. No, but no. this tells you a lot about our country that when I was a child, and I'm in my early 30s, I was watching my grandmother help people get splints on their wrists around the kitchen table because they couldn't afford to go to the hospital in America. Yeah. I got to tell you how coincidental that right now I'm, I'm writing a book called Jack the Ripper in Canada, which is actually, uh, uh, I'm a true crime guy like Al. So, but, but what's interesting is uh, in the mid 19th century there, the United States, refuse to have any kind of licensing because that took away your rights. But in Canada, because they were part of the, you know, the, the British Empire, that they had that. And it uh, really, what the, the psychopath that I deal with, he was the, what they called an Indian herb doctor, but he didn't do it to help people. He did it to make money and scam. Mm-hmm. But it was that battle right there. So it's kind of interesting how you said that. Well, and the fact that it's still happening, I mean, over over here we called those guys snake oil salesmen because, yeah, we have oh, yeah. a lot of them. But my grandma was literally, somebody would come in and just say, can I get a splint? Or can I get, is this cough bad? Should I actually go to the hospital? Or um, we ran out of medicine. Is there anything we can use around the house so we don't have to pay for more medicine? And my, the reason I bring that up at all is this should not be happening in a country as big and as wealthy as ours. We should not have to crowdfund our medical needs. Yeah, yeah, and, and hope that the lady next door has a splint when we get hurt. That's well, not right. 
Well, speaking of people who care, but actually the opposite side, because Al and I, we like to talk about people, psychopaths, psychopathy and <laughs> sociopathy, and serial offenders, serial killers. Isn't there a place in your book for one of those guys that you could really have an interesting story to? <laughs> I think we have one later in the series. Yes, later in the series we have a couple. But um, actually our upper echelon character talks about that because he is what's called citizen excellence standing. He is genetically modified to be what his corporation thinks is perfect, but his parents bribed the lab so that his brain would be unmodified. Most citizen excellent standing people can watch someone in agony and then go home and have dinner and not be bothered at all. They've been genetically modified to no longer have remorse. <laughs> yeah, to no longer have much remorse or much empathy. Um, yeah, not not just empathy, but lingering thoughts don't happen for them. Things happen and then they're done. And it was originally an idea to make it easier for them to have good mental health. Well, what it turned into is a whole generation of um, a dynasty of psychopaths being in positions of CEO, CFO, all those top tier positions all belong to psychopaths. Well, that actually is true. <laughs> I was going to say, not, not yeah. a whole lot different, but, you know. But now they're genetically modified that way. <laughs> Don't give the Republicans an idea. That's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely thought about that. <laughs> so if they won't be doing vaccines, they'll be doing that. So, you know, it's crazy. I mean, we're already getting shipped with the vaccine, right? So. Well, yeah, I, I go in for extra. I, 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 I want that. I want as many as possible. Get me shipped. <laughs> they can all follow me. <laughs> That's cool. Um, wow. So now, uh, uh, where do people come find you? Like, do you guys have a website together or a website or a, a location yeah. on social media that you think people would have their best fun finding you? Yeah. Uh, the website is O-E-Tierman, T-E-A-R-M-A-N-N dot com. Uh, from there, you can find links to buy the books uh, pretty much anywhere books are sold. We do suggest if you can to try and buy local in indie but also know that that's not always possible um from also on the website you can find links to our personal work and our social media uh we're on facebook and twitter most often um we also have a newsletter you can sign up for and all that good stuff as well great uh, and of course we're going to link that to ours as well so anybody listening or if they listen to the backlog and they're listening uh they can do one click and it'll bring them right to your site look out um wow so did did the did, did you seek covid or any sort of a virus into any of this series we did um and <laughs> <laughs> we actually have what was it Book six, Liv? Book five. We're book on five. book six right now. Well, no, but that, that, that was in. Yeah, that was book five. That was Draw Dead, which came out this uh, March. Right. And, yeah, we, we talked about the psychopaths a moment ago. Well, yeah. there's a bioweapon in book five. So it's not exactly uh, a pandemic, but... It operates like one. <laughs> yes. And if you happen to get any supplies on the black market you probably get sick and you probably die. And in our defense, we came up with this idea several years before 2020, <laughs> before COVID <laughs> was a thing yeah. uh, and, and had a moment while we were cleaning it up for publication of going, should we actually publish this in the middle of an actual pandemic? <laughs> yeah. He has had that moment. I had a moment of kicking the wall and going, are you kidding so you you guys did that too, you boy. It's it's all yeah. you guys. <laughs> um, but you know, I do you. Ha I have to ask. Anytime someone has a virus or pandemic or something going on in their books, so did you have like anti vaxxers and all this sort of stuff too in there, or did did that not come up? Did you ever think that there would be people like going around like they are now? Well, we um we do have so. Our story revolves around one unit in a resistance force. We did have a lot of Schottenfreud level fun with another unit 
So Aiden calls this other commander and says, okay, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. Um, can you help us out with X, Y, Z? And this guy says, it's just a cold. We're staying on mission. You guys can do whatever you want. Well, a few days later, his entire base is dead. So <laughs> we did have some schadenfreude fun with that. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, we definitely used that, but not to the degree that it actually happened in the real world, which was terrifying. Uh, my mom and several other relatives are in the armed forces, and I simply drew on that. It's fine. Walk it off. Oh, you're passing out. Walk it off. Mindset that yeah. is so deleterious in the American armed forces and leads to so many suicides in our armed forces. Um, but also had some cruel fun at a character's expense. Oh, you're going to ignore this disease? Fine. See how that goes for you. We definitely didn't have people going around shooting other people for wearing masks, though. <laughs> yes, not yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and partly because that would have been way too dark, and partly because when we were originally imagining this, it was simply not at that level. Well, that's yeah, something you wouldn't really believe. You go, well, no, people aren't really going to believe that, right? That's kind of a little too far-fetched. Yeah. Well, a lot of what's happened in the last couple, like year, year and a half has been... I've been looking at it and going, if I wrote this into a story, it would be critiqued as not believable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, it kind of goes too far, that. especially, yeah. well, the anti-science thing, there's always been, of course, a, a, a group of people that doesn't want to see a doctor or doesn't want to believe in, in science to a bit, but it just seemed to be out of hand, and um, it, it's, it's, just, it's just kind of beyond belief at how how strong it really is you know? mm -hmm. that's kind of the weird thing that's why i always wonder you know because when people write these the, the books and they have some sort of pandemic in it if they if, if they happen to have written that sort of thing before it happened that would be kind of cool <laughs> well we're no. sort of saved slightly because we didn't base this on a pandemic situation we based it on what happened here in america during prohibition Right. When our government poisoned all alcohol supplies so that if you drank, you would probably die. They really did kill people for doing something that the government didn't want them to do. Um, and granted, they, they made it very public. There is poison in all of this stuff. Don't drink it. But we drew from that idea of someone believing that they have the right to make someone else's decisions for them to the degree that they would poison water supplies and food supplies so that other people could not much them. different from what's actually happening right now. Yes. Yeah. So, so we were somewhat saved in that it wasn't directly analogous to what was happening with the pandemic, but I definitely kicked the wall and cussed a little bit um, as we realized when, book five was going to come out and in what circumstances. <laughs> it was a painful so, realization. So what we can do is I can start a conspiracy now that I think there was an ES and Olivia in Wuhan a little bit ago, <laughs> Al. They're doing something for their book. I, that's what I'm saying. You know, yeah. Just, <laughs> right. yeah, it's all one big marketing scheme. Uh, it's very, very <laughs> right. well thought out. That's great. Well, geez, this has been great. I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you guys. Um, we are running out of time. Plus, I've got to go to an anti-vax um, <laughs> um, rally here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got an NRA rally to go to. So I yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've got lots of things to, you know, I got a lot of things going on. I got to get some. Well, vacation. I literally have a pagan ceremony to get to tonight. Well, so <laughs> there, there you go, you know. And uh, um, geez, we had Michael Hughes on, and he did. He was part of that big. Um, um, magic, the magic for the resistance. You know, they were all. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was certainly it. that was fun. Anyway, our guests have been uh, from the writing group O.E. Terramin, and the book we were talking about is Hands. The hands were given aces high. Joker's Wild, book one. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you so much for having us. This was an amazing conversation. <laughs> This is yeah, this is lovely. Thank you.
To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.